My name is Sean Lee. Um, before we start, I'll give a quick image description of myself. So um, I'm someone who uses he and they pronouns. I am male presenting. I'm East Asian Chinese, and I'm also visibly disabled. So my shoulders aren't even, my back curves, and if we were to meet in person, I'd be quite short of stature. Uh, I've got light skin, I've got uh, black hair that kind of runs past my shoulders, and uh, I'm wearing these like steampunk glasses. They're green with these gold frames that kind of float on, uh, on the circles. And I'm wearing this like really colorful kind of print dress shirt. I graduated from UTSC's arts management program with a minor in English and studio art. Right now, I am the director of programming at Tangled Art and Disability. So I did an audio description of myself because I thought it was important to bring some of the practices of disability culture into everyday things that we do. Um, audio descriptions, self-descriptions being just, you know, one part of a host of cultural practices that crip folks enact when we get together. It's really a way to hack the sort of inaccessibility of um, everyday cultural ways of interacting. So I think for me, it's both a practical thing to do, but also it's a political thing. My journey is kind of straightforward, but also a little bit complicated. Um, I came in into UTSC um, really thinking that I would actually go into fashion. Um, I was really interested in fashion as kind of self-expression and um, I kind of went to into arts management thinking that I would have a very big, um, that, that I would be going into communications. And I did some work in the world of fashion, but at the same time, you know, I was progressing in my studio program. And so I took a few positions uh, doing community arts, working in gallery spaces. And I really felt that um, I was really inclined towards community art and really trying to, trying to use art as a form of expression for others. And at the same time, I was finding that fashion had a very stifled, kind of flattened idea of what, um, what beauty, what aesthetics was, and it was a mold that I never really found that I fit into. I was doing studio, and at the time, uh, Tanya Mars, who is my professor, really encouraged, you know, thinking of performance art and the body as a medium. And for myself, you know, I really, noticed a lot of times that artists, they were using their bodies as a medium that was kind of prescribed with meanings. And for me, as a queer, disabled person of color, you know, my body is inscribed with a lot of preconceived notions, with a lot of meanings. And so it was something I really tried to grapple with in my time doing performance art. And it gave me a politic around disability that I think was very important. And it made me research disability in ways that, you know, uh, led me to thinking more critically about how the world engages disability. So I found, you know, in my time here at UTSC that I was taught about um, a variety of arts movements, you know, the queer arts movement, feminist art movements, uh, indigenous-led arts movements, um, you know, from other BIPOC uh, organizations and communities as well. But disability was oftentimes left curiously out of that conversation. And if it was, it came in from a place of charity or from a place of, um, of deficit. And so I really wanted to explore, you know, how my story of disability fit into this kind of intersectional, tangled, you know, identity that I was living. And at the time, I was doing an internship um, at the Art Gallery of Ontario with uh, Deirdre Logue and Alison Mitchell from Feminist Art Gallery. And um, they introduced me to Eliza Chandler, who was the artistic director at the time of Tangled. Simultaneously, Tanya Mars introduced me to Rena Fraticelli, 
And then where I was working at Scarborough Arts, um, Tamla Matthews introduced me to Kara Eastcott. So in the course of like, I wanna say six months, everyone kind of said, have you heard about Tangled? And I sort of thought like, okay, I get it. I should check out Tangled. Um, and I'm so glad I did because, you know, I, I think Tangled really extended this invitation to me to consider disability uh, differently, you know, with desire and with uh, a desire for the disruption that disability brings. So I, I began to really develop a politic um, around disability as a culture and to understand, you know, the importance of accessibility within the work that I do, but also in the greater scheme of how access is um, enacted and engaged in other arts organizations and communities. So at the time, Tangled was launching the Tangled Art Gallery, which um, was the first disability art gallery dedicated to, you know, exhibiting uh, works from mad, deaf, and disabled artists, as well as advancing accessible curatorial practices. So I just sort of happened to be in the right place, having met Eliza at the time. I had this really extensive, um, you know, marketing and PR background, and they had no plan for launching this, what I thought was like such a significant gallery. And so I sort of wedged myself in there and I said, here, let me do some PR, let me do some marketing for, for you folks. And um, at the time, I just really wanted to get involved with Tangled. So I applied for an Ontario Art Council, the Skills and Career Development Grant, and I wrote myself a grant to become their first curator in residence. Um, and one thing led to another. I did the residency and um, you know now I'm the director of programming. So it was, it's really interesting. Like I didn't necessarily have a background in curation, but I think that actually led me to take more risks and do things differently in a way that perhaps, um, you know, that, that uh, perhaps lends itself to the spirit of disability arts and accessible curation. I, I always think back to this one phrase by Yinka Shonabare, who's um, a Turner Prize nominated artist in the UK, an incredible disability artist who says that disability arts is the last avant-garde movement. Um, and I'm really driven by that idea of disability arts as the last avant-garde. I think to bring my identity into the work that I do has actually been very liberating in some ways for me. Um, instead of having to hide disability, I think the thing is that we've always been told by like just culturally, by the stories that we see in the media that we're trying to eliminate the presence of disability in normative spaces. And so I think for me, like I, I'm really inspired to continue bringing my whole self because it's a place of privilege that I think others can't, uh, can't at times uh, do. As someone who works in a specific disability arts organization that's disability led, that's um, bringing other disabled folks in, like I, I really think that I have almost a responsibility in some ways to bring my whole self in because if I shy away from it, then um, I don't know who else might shy away from it as well. I think I come, I've come into a place of privilege in being able to, um, to sort of proudly identify as disabled. The thing about institutions is that they're really interested in bringing in what they would call equity seeking priority groups. And then when that reality kind of pushes against this neoliberal capitalist idea of what success looks like, that's when it can, uh, you can encounter a lot of friction. And that friction is something that I think bringing disabled people in can make that friction very generative. Like, I think disabled folks are the best workers and I have a great team at Tangled. And I, I, I say best workers like not in this neoliberal sense of like, oh, 
we are the most productive team in the world. Like I think we challenge this idea of what is a sustainable and what is a human workplace. So, you know, for me, when deadlines are pushed, when things aren't done in perhaps the same way that they that someone was under expecting or understanding it to be. Yeah, I think that's a moment for us to intervene and think about how disability culture asks us to do not what's expected, but what our bodies can do. But disability is, is everywhere, and ableism, unfortunately, is everywhere. And so we're always trying to think about how it is that we can create and commit to an anti-ableist world. I think in a couple years, I'd like to see someone take my place and continue to build what disability practices, what crip aesthetics uh, are. And I'd like to see myself sort of agitating towards a better future in institutions. I've recently joined the board of the Toronto Art Council, and you know, I, I get invited to a lot of different advisory committees. I'm doing teaching. And so I really think that I'm taking the practices I've learned um, and I'm trying to create better structures, more support for disabled artists to be able to kind of bring themselves wholly into the arts ecology. I always think about the work I'm doing as a horizon and if I can quote, you know, um, Jose Esteban Muno, you know, Jose uh, talks about this queer horizon, this, this warmth of an elsewhere and else when in which queerness has manifested. And I, I always think what the crip horizon looks like that kind of illuminates us and is always out of reach because we're always striving for better and always striving towards a more equitable, a better world, one where we can be ourselves. And that's what I, I'm really excited for is to continue to bring this work to other spaces and for um, disability arts, for accessible curatorial practices to grow and kind of infiltrate all the little nooks and crannies of our arts ecology. I would say you're valid. You've got so much happening in life and this is not an easy time that you're navigating. And so there are resources and there is community there to support. As somebody who, who doesn't have an invisible disability, um, I sort of live this, this other life that's hyper visibly disabled, that always gets acknowledged as, as disabled, which can be really frustrating. And I think from my friends with invisible disabilities, you know, I've heard almost the opposite, that you have to justify your disability. Un unfortunately, right now we're in a world where, you know, people have to prove their disability. So if I could go back and tell my younger self something, it would be to make more unapologetically disabled art. It would really be to lean into who I want to be as an artist. and you know, screw all the other people that don't understand it. That culture isn't there yet, and you're the one who's creating it. You know, to also think about the role of access in your work. Like, um, it's really important to bring other people into this space if you want community of disabled folks. But I think, yeah, to just really continue building a practice because there's so many amazing people doing this kind of work. And if you come out of school with the portfolio you have, you are gonna be a bit of a cliche. <laughs>